Hello, my name is Catherine Michinilli and I work for the Development Office of the College of Europe. I'm one of the project managers in charge of organising this webinar, which is linked to the Executive Education course on the Energy Union, which will take place this summer. Before leaving the floor to Professor Dirk Buschler, um, I'd like to just uh, give a few words about the College of Europe for those who may not know it. The College of Europe is the first postgraduate institute in European affairs and was founded in 1949. It has two campuses, one in Belgium, in Bruges, from where I am speaking, and one in Poland, in Natalin. It offers several master's degree, degrees, four here in Bruges, one in Poland, and we recently just launched a joint master's degree with the Fletcher School in the US. We also have uh, the Development Office at the College of Europe, that's the department where I work, uh, and it is in charge of organising professional training courses for um, uh, professional training courses and executive education courses on EU affairs. We also manage uh, European funded projects. Now um, we'll just go briefly through the webinar agenda so that you know what to expect uh, in the next half hour. We will have um, uh, the pleasure to uh, listen to Professor Dirk Buschle for 20 minutes on the European energy policy, the state of the energy union. And during this time, of course, uh, I'll ask you to pay attention, but also, if possible, to send through your questions. Uh, there is a little box at the right hand of the video screen on your uh, main uh, laptop or computer monitor. So if you could just type them through there, then I'll be able to read them and read them out to uh, the professor in the five-minute Q&A that we have after the lecture. Uh, should we receive too many questions, do not worry, we will be able to answer them uh, subsequently by email. Finally, after the Q&A, we'll I'll conclude briefly uh, by giving you more information on the Energy Union Executive Education course this summer. So without further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Dirk Buschle, who is chairholder of the Alcoa funded energy uh, chair here at the College of Europe and also a deputy director of the um, energy community in Vienna. Dirk, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Catherine, and uh, welcome to this webinar on the State of the Union. That's the State of the Energy Union, one of the priorities of the current Juncker Commission. We will have more Europe in energy indeed, and that's good news because it's something that everybody all the member states and most stakeholders can agree to. It's something that even David Cameron underlined just before he pulled the plug on the UK uh, that energy is one of the topic, if not the topic, where more, not less Europe is needed. The problem is that everybody seems to understand something a bit different from uh, what energy policy actually should mean. Should the focus be on energy security? Should it be on combating climate change? Should it be on completing the internal market? So uh, we have to face, and we have always faced that in energy policy, the trilemma of three sometimes rivaling objectives. And uh, that has something to do also with the fact that in the current state of the European Union, maybe there is more of diversity than there is uh, unity, to quote the European Union's motto. Uh, but it for sure has to do with with the fact that these three objectives, the three objectives that make for the European energy policies trilemma, leave room to choose and pick your favorite one. So that's precisely what we are seeing. We uh, can ask ourselves the question, um, is the energy union a tool which is reinventing or rebranding European energy policy, uh, policy as we know it? When uh, created in 2014, 2015, the energy union actually did not resolve the trilemma, but it rephrased it. If I may recall, the key elements of the energy union Union project at the outset uh, were five dimensions, energy security, solidarity and trust, internal energy market, moderation of demand, decarbonization, including renewable energy, research and innovation and competitiveness. So something for everybody and we were supposed and now we're actually seeing 
how uh, of that package uh, the things get more concrete. In 2016, the year of delivery was announced. In 2017, the year of implementation. Maybe the commission language is a bit ahead of the reality because in 2016, what came were the proposals and two, uh, 2017 is supposed to see the adoption of those proposals. Implementation may then come a little bit later. But what's actually on the table? We have in front of us a clean energy package consisting of eight pieces of draft legislation, uh, legislation, mostly regulations. That already is an indication how serious the European Commission is with that package. Regulations we know don't have to be transposed, but are directly applicable in all member states. And in EU standards, the orientation, the overall orientation is relatively clear. Um, we have three policy objectives that this package pursues. Energy efficiency first, global leadership in renewables, and uh, a fair deal for consumers. Now, let's have a brief overview of the draft legislative package. If you um, allow me, I will not go into too many details because we only have limited time. The first focus of the package that has been tabled in November 2016 is the reform of the European electricity market as well as security of electricity supply. The packages as we know them used to be relatively high level. Um, that means that this is a chance now, and it was used, that chance, uh, to refine the general principles in the uh, first, second and third package. Um, we, for example, have the continuation of certain policy goals also now in the clean energy package. We see a proposal for further price deregulation. Uh, we may remember that the existing third energy package still has that actually rather bad formula compromise between liberalization and public service obligation in its Articles 3. Now this has been taken forward. Um, we have a, an improved uh, set of consumer information and the market design has been more detailed. But most importantly probably what the electricity proposed electricity package does, it addresses the consequences of the renewables boom. The consequences of the increase in renewable energy on the markets and for the grids. Now um, these are the consequences obviously of a, an energy transition that took place in the European member state and what we are witnessing here is that this, this energy transition is being um, upgraded to a European energy transition. What are the key elements here? We have um, priority dispatch for renewable energy only for smaller installations. There is a great focus on the so-called capacity market, so markets not for energy but for the potential uh, to provide backup energy if needed. Of course that is closely linked to the renewables boom. We have, uh, as part of that aspect, an uh, attempt to open those markets by the Commission um, towards uh, a true pan-European market, so a cross-border. And um, we see also that the Commission asks Member States to set for themselves adequacy targets and also environmental standards for the capacity market, something that, as far as we can tell, will meet the resistance of certain Member States. We also um, see the attempt and the um, will to bring the consumers on the market. Those consumers who have their solar panels on the rooftops um, should actually be integrated in our electricity market, be it directly or be it through aggregators and cooperatives. We also see more focus on the distribution networks. The past three packages have always and almost unilaterally focused on transmission. Now it's time for distribution. That's the network that actually has to handle uh, 
the um, renewables increase. We see better demand response proposals for uh, making storage pricing also attractive. Maybe something um, that has, is an innovation, um, has nothing directly to do with the renewables, is the creation of regional operational centers, a creation of a level in terms of transmission system operator between the national one and the European one. There is a certain nervousness among member states and operators that they may end up in a void between these two well-known levels and uh, become something third that is not yet very well defined. In security of supply, we see essentially a repetition of what has been done already for gas a couple of years ago. So to make the preparedness of, uh, for risk, the assessment of risk, and also the managing of crisis situation, something that is being done in coordination on European and regional level. Let me turn to renewable energy. Renewable energy is the second part of the package there we see that the Commission tries to implement the Council's decision of 2014 to move to a 20% target by 2013 for the entire EU. We know that the renewables have essentially or are about to achieve grid parity and still um, we see the detrimental effect of the support schemes to promote those renewables um, on the energy market. We are in a classical dilemma here. On the one side, to have more renewables, to regain global leadership, as the Commission formulates, and at the same time, to have to integrate that into markets which are threatened by this um, boom of renewables if it is not well coordinated. Um, phasing out the uh, um, feed-in tariffs was a rough thing, did uh, not always go without uh, lawsuits as well. And uh, it is something that the investors may not always be used to because uh, they enjoyed uh, quite uh, a generous uh, treatment under the old scheme. Now the Commission uh, repeats here in the legislative package something that has already been anticipated in state aid enforcement that is moving to market-based mechanisms such as auctions the Commission attempts um, to uh, open these auctions also across border, again something that has failed through judicial action but is now being introduced through legislation. One-stop permitting, one-stop shop permitting is on the table, something similar uh, to the so-called 10E regulation. Um, and the increase of uh, renewables also in heating and cooling, um, the uh, review of the sustainability criteria for biofuels, uh, all of these relate back to very intense discussions that have uh, been held in the um, community. Uh, maybe the most interesting part uh, conceptually is the fact that the Commission had to deal with an EU-only target, so the EU sets a target for itself that cannot be broken down, as was the case before, to member state targets, which could then be implemented and enforced. Um, that challenge is resolved through governance. The third major thrust of this legisl legislative package um, the, in the governance regulation, in the proposed governance regulation, the Commission suggests um, that the member states draft 10 years integrated energy and climate plans on a European template, uh, that they submit these drafts for consultations uh, as well as their longer term strategies. Um, and these drafts are supposed to show the way and outline the measures on how to achieve a whole number of European and international targets that the member states have committed to. <coughs> this is, um, in essence, the uh, legislative uh, package which we have been presented with in November 2016. Of course, I cannot uh, close this chapter without talking about energy efficiency. It's um, for sure it shouldn't be the last one as it is our first fuel. And here the Commission comes with a bold proposal um, to move to a 30% binding target uh, by two, uh, 2030. Again, something which has 
has not uh, met only enthusiasm in the uh, council meeting on Monday. And one of the key elements is to continue with the energy saving obligations, the big innovation from the last energy efficiency directive, also until 2013. 30. <clears throat> if we look at this legislative package of November only, I think our view on the energy union would not be complete. That's why I would like to offer a brief glance on what else is on the table, and that of, is, of course, the security of a gas supply regulation, something that has been proposed already early last year and which has been intensively discussed in the EU legislative process. We um, saw a proposal by the Commission which has has tried to make the principle of solidarity one of the key principles of the energy union, but so far not very well defined, something really tangible, uh, and to put solidarity obligations on member states for other member states in case their household and social institutions um, are in need of gas supplies in case of emergency. We also um, s have seen a, uh, the proposal to um, oblige member states to notify significant long-term gas contracts, similar to the intergovernmental agreements to the Commission. And we also seen a shift from a national to a regional approach in assessing uh, and also in assessing the risk and also managing the risk once it has turned into a crisis. There, in the discussions in the uh, European Parliament, this uh, was essentially supported, even though the concept of region was a bit shifted to a concept of corridors. In uh, the Council meeting in December 2016, the there was a certain unease with the definition of the regional uh, groups, so with the concept of regionalization. Um, and also, uh, one of the things that have been put on the table is here, when the solidarity obligation, this uh, new element of security of supply, kicks in, then we should envisage a compensation. <clears throat> what is important here to note is that despite this um, security of supply obligation um, being indeed a key element of the energy union, it is about the union's resilience. It is not necessarily what is associated also with security of supply, external policy. I will be very brief on emission trading because there is very recent news and I will let you all follow that up on uh, the media. There was a meeting of the Environmental Council on uh, Tuesday and they seem to have, um, they seem to have achieve, achieved a compromise, um, which is something very good. The details we will keep out of this discussion here. Let me um, maybe conclude. The first reactions to the package, as to be expected, um, have been uh, mixed. The Energy Council has discussed it uh, this Monday. You can see in the conclusion a little bit of nervousness. Uh, there is reference to competences over the energy mix of the member states, the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. Uh, and you can ask yourself whether it was smart to package such a huge um, bundle of legislation together um, for the negotiations. But then again, they are so intrinsically interlinked that it would probably have been difficult to cut them into slices. Well, time will tell. What um, is in the, um, when we talk about or when we review the clean energy package at this uh, very early stage, um, can we say that we uh, are about to recalibrate the European energy policy trilemma, the one on which I started. Uh, well, what we can see is a certain focus, that is for sure. Uh, the European Commission used the momentum of the Paris Agreement, a gift that it was not necessarily only um, presented by Europeans. We know that other actors have played their role there. And to focus on the decarbonization aspect of the energy union's trilemma on the low carbon um, dimension. Uh, 
That is interesting in uh, the respect that the original idea behind the energy union was much more one of energy security, was much more one of geopolitics when it was presented by then Prime Minister Donald Tusk. Uh, something that is almost completely lacking in this package now. There is no more talks about the external dimension um, and maybe only vaguely about the energy diplomacy. Um, but this has to be again seen against a global background. The geopolitics is getting more complicated and it's probably fair to say that the EU in this reshuffled uh, global political game is uh, less an actor than individual member states, at least when it comes to hardcore geopolitical issue. The message is do your homework first, Europe, so you organize your market in a way that it can be resilient um, and it can achieve progress on other stages such as the decarbonization. When we look at the markets themselves, what we observe is that the um, old approach in the first three packages, an ordo-liberal approach, namely to set a framework uh, with elements such as unbundling, market opening, etc., uh, has been changed, has been given way to following the development of the energy markets themselves, has been um, resulted has resulted in a true market design that is something that indeed was missing it started with the network codes and now it is being incorporated and further developed in this package <clears throat> but of course there is a risk involved in that if you uh, don't set only the framework conditions but try to follow the market trends uh, that means that you have to follow up very closely or it will leave you behind but the good aspect of this is maybe it's the first time in energy policies history that innovation is not only a challenge but a chance as well there hasn't been so much innovation in the energy policy um, over the last decades. Now, um, if we look at the energy union taking shape after this package, uh, let me summarize, there is a new focus. It is about making the energy transition not a member state only project, but a true European project. The instrument is a legal package, so there's still a lot of laws in there. But um, most interestingly, and also most interestingly for the College of, of Europe, is the fact that we see a new energy union governance emerging, and there is a new paradigm in that that's not so much imposing and then enforcing, but it is rather a um, iterative process of sharing and commenting plans and making recommendations. It's not a new invention. We know that from the European semester, but we also know it from the United Nations, um, where uh, this approach has been followed in climate policy. But then again, the United Nations is an organization of 193 members and unanimity applies. <clears throat> the effectiveness of this approach, of course, remains to be seen, um, but what uh, certainly is positive is that if you embark and if we all of us embark on such a uh, fundamental and uh, fundamentally changing project as decarbonizing our energy sectors, decarbonizing our societies, then a pure top-down approach is indeed something that will not work. That is a lesson learned and that brings us also um, to the general climate of and the gen general background of European integration where I believe these kind of lessons learned and applied is indeed something that is positive, must be welcomed and should be supported. With this I would like to conclude and I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dirk, for that um, that lecture. Thank you also for summarizing everything so bravely because there was a, a lot to, to cover uh, in 20 minutes. So thank you for making that effort of condensation. Um, I have um, a question for you. Um, given uh, your involvement within the energy community and given what you said over the um, uh, energy union and the the fact that now um, energy transition has to become a European project. Where do you see 
uh, the logic and rationale of the energy union within uh, beyond Europe? Do you see possibilities of um, it uh, affecting countries outside the EU, um, such as, for example, the enlargement countries? The energy community is a project that expands the European energy policy and law to countries in Europe which are not members of the European Union. But it is also a, uh, an integral part of the energy union process in um, promoting and actually also implementing European policy and law. We will at one point also uh, probably adopt, incorporate and implement this clean energy package of last November. Um, the countries outside the European Union contribute to the um, goals of European energy policy and make Europe stronger in the wind of globalization. Um, that is something very important. Now, I do hope that this focus on in the clean energy package on decarbonization and the market governance will at some point be also uh, contemplated by a focus on the external policy. And there the energy community can probably offer the most advanced um, governance framework as well on how to make sure that what we do inside Europe um, is not only a project limited to 28 member states, but is a truly pan-European project. Thank you very much. Um, I have also uh, another question um, related to your conclusion, uh, where you mention possibility or like the issue of a multi-speed uh, energy uh, Europe. Um, President Juncker unveiled yesterday the Commission's white paper for future scenarios of the EU. Where do you see uh, the energy union developing fully? In what type of EU can support the energy union or, or vice versa? You are asking me to pick one of the five options that were discussed in that <laughs> white paper. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, but I believe that the energy union can indeed uh, contribute a lot uh, to that discussion. The energy union is something that cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be seen, and, and this is very closely influenced by the state of the European Union in general. And I believe from this clean energy package, the most interesting aspect is probably uh, the one of the governance. This uh, white paper uh, of this week is essentially about the European Union governance. And we have here in the energy union, so in energy policy, something quite advanced and something not abstract, but very, um, very concrete that Europe in general can probably learn from. I'm not only talking about this idea of reviewing and commenting uh, drafts of energy strategies and plans. I'm talking about the energy union's governance in a broader sense. So that is the relation of all the actors, the decision-making procedures, uh, which is something that is um, now becoming also is getting a new impetus, but is also becoming clearer now after this uh, new clean energy package. And I believe that if these processes are well interlinked, then the energy union has a lot to contribute beyond the energy sector yeah. only. Thank you very much. Um, we have reached our time limit, so I would like to thank you again for answering questions, for uh, giving us this lecture. And um, I will now, as promised, um, go a bit more in detail into the uh, program of um, this summer. Uh, it is an executive education course organized um, by our department, the Development Office of the College of Europe. It's a two-week course from 3rd to 14th of July. And uh, Professor Bushler is also one of our trainers uh, during the course. So we um, look forward to welcoming him back um, here. And um, so, as promised, just to give you some information, the course is two weeks and it uh, aims at um, addressing these five components of the energy union uh, strategy. So after a general introduction into EU energy governance, uh, into the energy union, we, we, look at, uh, we will look at um, the role, uh, the, the 
the role of uh, geopolitics of energy, for energy security, uh, energy efficiency, uh, EU energy markets or EU electricity and EU electricity markets. We will also have a blend between um, lectures, uh, visits and um, exercises. So at the end of, of the first week, you will see uh, several case studies as well. In the second week instead, we um, will cover uh, the issue, of course, of climate change, uh, the ETS, and, um, and then we will look more at the, at the last um, component of uh, innovation, competitiveness, consumers. And uh, throughout this, there will be, uh, as mentioned, uh, also several simulation games. And of course, uh, we will have visits. So in the first week, we will go to the LNG terminal at the port of Zeebrugge, not far from here. And in the second week, we will aim at um, visiting uh, the EU institution, namely DG Energy and DG Research in Brussels, uh, where participants will have the opportunity of uh, connecting and uh, discussing energy matters with high level uh, EU officials specializing on uh, these topics. Overall, uh, it is a dense program, but very comprehensive. We really hope to see you there this summer. And um, for more information, you can visit uh, our website, www.colorope.eu forward slash energy union. And should you uh, want more information on our other courses on offer, either during summer or autumn, please uh, visit www.colorope.eu forward slash executive education. Should you have further questions or remarks uh, or rem questions for, for the professor, please do not hesitate to email us at info.development at coloreup.eu. Thank you again for your attention and uh, participation. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.